The gospel for today, uh, this third Sunday, Gaudete or Rejoice Sunday, uh, is about John the Baptist. Because he is the one who prepares the world for Christ. So in him, uh, in one way, the whole vocation of Israel is summed up. And in another way, the whole vocation of Israel is summed up in Mary, who actually gives physical birth to the Word made flesh. Now, if you ever go into an Eastern Rite church, you'll see that the two big icons that are on either side of the holy doors are John the Baptist and Mary. Because they are the summation of the Jewish people's vocation. John is the last and greatest of the prophets. Can you imagine how enlightened he was? And how courageous he was? I mean, he was telling these people, you have got to change. You've got to get ready. The Messiah is coming. And so, he often talks about the wrath to come. But the wrath is the moment of decision, as I think we spoke about before. It's the presence of the love of God. And if we're not interested, we feel repulsed. But it's not because God is mad, it's because we can't stand love. We don't want it. We want, I don't want to be loved by you and have to change. I just want to be myself, my own rotten self. And so we feel it like wrath. And so, in this text, you see, after saying in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was turned towards God, and so forth, all things were made through Him, and in Him was light, um, life, and the life was the light of man, and so forth. Then we come to this part where our Gospel picks up for today, and it says, um, you see, uh, there was a man, uh, I'm trying to see where I have my English tra uh, translation of that, oh, okay. A man named John, was sent from God. And he came, see, Is Marturion, he came as a witness, okay, uh, uh, that he might witness regarding the light. Jesus is the light. And he's going to witness to the light. All of a sudden, you know, if you're in a dark room, and you're kind of lonely, and you're sitting there, and uh, somebody gives you and turns on the light. John turned on the light. It's real, folks. The Messiah is coming. And he's coming to set Israel free, not just to get rid of the Romans, but to fulfill all that he promised. I'm promising you that. In fact, I'm going to lay down my life and testimony to it. Now, he laid down his life. How? He, he testified to the king, that's not your wife. You should not have her as your wife. And he did it publicly. Why? Because rulers and lawmakers can send a whole country down the garden tubes, the, the uh, garden path, or the tubes, either one, but not both. Uh, you see? So that's the problem with the Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade. All of a sudden, murder is legal. Oh, can we can all do it? No, you can't. Legality is not the same as morality. Otherwise, everything Hitler did was moral. He had the laws for it. So, John protests and finally dies because of it. What we have here, of course, is this, you see, sent from God, his name was John. He came as a testimony that he might testify concerning the light, the phos. The light we just talked about in the early part of the prologue, where it says, finally, uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. You know what that means? At the end of this same prologue, it says what? And he was the light, the, the, the Logos was the light enlightening every man coming into the world. That means every time we think, we participate in the light of God. Our mind is what Aquinas calls a quedam impressio divini luminis. It's a certain imprint of the divine life. And every time we speak, you see, 
we share in the mystery of the Logos. You think these old theologians were dried up sticks? No. They couldn't be because they're talking about divine reality. You have to speak poetically. And so John is, is telling them. Now, the testimony in the um, other Gospels is pretty neat, pretty net. You see, John came, uh, I think I described this before, sort of repeating the conversion rite for a non-Jew becoming a Jew. Part of it was this proselyte baptism. What John is saying is, you're not Jews. You know, you're born Jews. You have Jewish flesh. You're circumcised. I'm telling you, your kind of Jew, God can raise up from stones. You've got to change. Now, he was a credible man. And the Jews, unless they were totally sold down the river, had respect for prophet. This guy's a prophet. Whatever he's saying, we better do. And he's saying, it's on the way. So then they were baptized, confessing their sins, you see. And it was sort of a, and this was a rite, as he told them, this is a rite preparing you <laughs> for the one coming after me, you see. And that's why he says, I'm baptizing you in water. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. That is, he is going to, and that means he will pour out the Spirit on you. That's a promise of the fulfillment of a whole theme in the Old Testament. I think it was just last week, I gave you a few texts like Joel 3 for certain, that's the one Peter quotes at Pentecost, and then uh Isaiah 44, Ezekiel 36, promise of the outpouring of the Spirit. And Peter, I know I quoted this recently, Acts 2, I think it's 38, and raised up to the right hand of the Father, he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he poured him out. He baptized. You see? And he's fulfilling that promise which is in the Old Testament. So John is doing that, you see? Uh, so he witnesses. Now, if you listen closely to the witness, you see, uh, they're all trying to figure out, well, who are you? You're a pretty important figure. So are you the one to come? That's the first thing they ask him, see? See, um, who are you? He admitted it and did not deny it. He admitted, I am not the Messiah. You realize that those of us who preach and get popular, we got to say to ourselves 500 times a day and everybody else 300 times a day, I am not the Messiah. I work for him. You see? Don't get confused. Uh, you know, there's a proverb, in the desert, a man with a cup of muddy water is rich. You see? Okay. Okay. Uh, I am not the Messiah. Well, who are you then? Are you Elijah? Well, you all know the great Jewish expectation that Elijah would come to prepare the way of the Messiah. In one way, he was Elijah, and Jesus calls him Elijah. Another way, I'm not Elijah. Uh, well, then are you the prophet? That prophet is the prophet in Deuteronomy 18, remember? Maybe you don't. Uh, he's talking. Moses. And he's saying, you know, there's going to be false prophets. But then there's going to be but, there's going to, but a prophet like me. Now, he's talking about any prophet like him who comes along. But the Jewish expectation settled finally. There will be the prophet. There will be a prophet just like him. Uh, and so, uh, I only have time to, it's in Deuteronomy 18, starts with verse 9, but I'm just going to read, you see, uh, you must be sincere toward the Lord and these nations. A prophet like me, verse 15, will the Lord your God raise up for you from among your own kinsmen. And more than one. But in a way, there will be the prophet. And that's, and he's the one who's going to get everything ready for the coming of the Messiah. And so they're asking him, are you the prophet? You see? Uh, and he says, no, I'm not the prophet. Huh? So who are you? And then 
he quotes this line that is so precious. I'm the voice of one crying out in the desert, make stray the way of the Lord. That prophecy was held in such honor and respect. It was at, it's at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a, there's going to be a preparation for the Messiah. And it's the one saying, make straight the way of the Lord in the desert. I'm going to bring my people back. And it's going to be a foreshadowing of what I do when I come back myself. So they come back. And they build the temple. And they're, they, they, but they recognize that all they're doing it's not yet the fulfillment of this prophecy. I think I've quoted before. It's in the book of Ezra, I think, chapter 3. They built this temple. And the old timers are saying, what a miserable excuse for a temple. And the youngsters who never saw a temple are saying, whoopee, we got a temple. But the old timers, this is no temple. So then the, the writer says, and the sounds of weeping and the sounds of rejoicing were so mingled you couldn't tell one from the other. That's the ambiguity of this time after the exile, which was several hundred years, waiting for the Messiah. Then John bursts on the scene and says, This is it. I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. This prophecy, I'm the fulfillment. I'm the one, you know, fulfilling this prophecy. Uh, I don't know whether they don't get it or don't want to get it. They say, well, so, listen, some of the Pharisees were there, and the Pharisees are very strict observers of the laws, you know. Then why do you baptize if you're not Christ or Elijah or the prophet? Why don't they ask him, why do you mean by voice crying in the wilderness? Why don't they do that? Maybe they don't want to know. John says, I baptize with water, but there is one among you who you do not recognize, the one coming after me whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. You see how he loves Jesus. I can, I'm not even fit to untie his sandals. Later on, when the his disciples are saying, "Hey, you know what? Jesus is baptizing and making more disciples than you." And what does he say? The the bridegroom rejoices to hear the voice. I mean, the the the, the best man rejoices to hear the voice of the bridegroom. He must get greater. I must get less. That's love, right? And that's knowing your place. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Jesus. You know? And I think we priests have to listen to this because sometimes we think of, oh, well, I'm really nicer than Jesus. You know, the teenagers are having sex. And, you know, well, it's all right. It's not all right. Jesus said it wasn't. And I'm not nicer than Jesus. And I haven't saved anybody. If I get crucified tomorrow, it'll certainly be painful. But it's not going to save anybody. Except if I offer up all that in union with Jesus, it'll be a help. But being nicer than Jesus, you can't do that. It's not the church. We're like the Baptist. We witness to Jesus. Put people in touch with Jesus. And then when they come to know his love and affection, they melt. Giving up sin is no problem at all. Oh, you know, I know, hundreds of people who have had that experience. Huh? Come to know Jesus, turn your back on sin, and then want to tell everybody, you know, what God has done for you. That's the Baptist. And so, one more Sunday and we're ready for Christmas. <laughs>